Okay, so the topic looks really depressing. And it is a tough topic, but we're actually going to have a lot of fun with this. And by the end of today's talk, which is today called Out of the Shadows, the unspoken social and emotional challenges of living with food sensitivities. By the end of this, you're going to be feeling like superheroes. Uh, special diet superheroes instead of culinary outcasts. And, and hopefully feel good about where we're going and uh, maybe increase your compassion a little bit and, um, and just shifting how you're thinking about the world. As you see up there, I'm not sure how many, I'm not sure if I know any of you from my past lives, but I'm here from Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm, a, I'm originally from California, but I've been in BC for about almost 22 years. And I'm a psychologist, and I'm also, I do a lot of other kinds of healing work, uh, things like cranial sacral therapy, um, visceral manipulation, energy-based healing, and I incorporate a lot of things in, in my life. Um, I, I also had um, been very, very sick. I was sick my whole life, probably to some degree, with migraines and, and um, uh, low blood, uh, low anemia and such, no, low blood iron. But I became very, very sick in 1997. And I became so sick that over the next 12 years, uh, I didn't know if I was gonna be, live to make it to be 50. And I'm now 51, so I've made it, yay. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be around. I had just had my daughter in 1997, and the trauma of that child, that, that having my daughter uh, triggered, which it does for many people, um, my autoimmune challenges that I didn't even realize I had. I knew I had allergies and asthma, but I didn't realize that I had uh, celiac disease as well, and who knows what else. So my life was on a big journey. It took 12 years to figure that out, and that's part of why I got into all these other healing modalities and be have become like this superhero healer because, not because I'm a superhero, but just I was desperate and I wanted to live for my daughter to at least have a mother when she graduated high school. And she just graduated and has just started university this month. So it's a very, it's a very cel time of celebration just as my book, um, Yum, has come out. Anyway, I'm a psychologist, been doing this work about 29 years and that overlaying with my life experiences with the food sensitivities and and health um, disabilities has given me a wisdom and understanding and, and a deeper compassion for the experience of living that I'm really excited to share. And that combined with the, the beautiful clients that I've worked with who also, there's a real rise uh, I've noticed over the past 29 years in autoimmune tr uh, difficulties, in food sensitivities, in diabetes, in a lot of things that are resulting in people's uh, dietary um, choices getting reduced and I've been witnessing from the outside as well as from the inside how that can emotionally impact people and uh, not just the sense of loss of which we're going to talk a little bit more about a lot more about um, during today's talk but also a change in orientation to relationships with others in the world and we're going to speak about that also because I'm ready for us to make a change, and, and I'm no Martin Luther King, but I have a dream, <coughs> and I have a lot of dreams, and, um, and I really believe that when we come together, we can, we can make changes in how people think and, and move forward. Uh, but before I go further, um, this is a big decision, but um, I'm talking about the missing piece here, first of all, that, that there's more knowledge just in the past 10, 20 years about celiac disease, autoimmune disorders, but we're just in baby steps. But the primary focus is really on the physical, what, what's going on physically, you know, those of us who get these neurologic problems and, and joint problems and gut problems or all of the above, like you know, many of us here have had. Um, but what hasn't been discussed is really the, um, the emotional implications of, the, of, of, of living uh, with these health challenges that are invisible largely. <coughs> I say largely because um, when we talk about um, well, I even mentioned my story, you know, I mentioned how I, I know what it's like to live with food sensitivities. And you look at this picture, and I love it, I had professional makeup and hair done, it made, made me look extra good, but I look like a pretty normal person, and relatively healthy, which, which I am at this point, I'm I still, you know, we're all dodging, dodging the ball, but we, uh, but I want you to know that I also have experienced severe health challenges, and 
the, the decision to put a photo up uh, in the midst. This was a photo in 2004, um, kind of in the middle of the time before I even knew what was wrong. You can see my, my tonsils were swollen for about seven or eight years straight, nonstop. I had every infection on the planet. This was actually me feeling pretty good. Um, I was inflamed everywhere. I was on all kinds of steroids. And um, you can just see in the picture, you know, I don't look quite as healthy as, as I did you know, 11 years later. Um, so I just want to let you know that wherever you are in your journey, you know, if you are or if you have loved ones who are struggling around health, I want you to know that I understand. I'm not coming at this as a Pollyanna, even though I laugh a lot, and I'm going to help you laugh a lot and, and just change into a, a more positive outlook on life. Making lemonade out of lemons. So with this idea of the... Uh, the um, emotional and social implications as one more step above and beyond now. We're ready for the, for, we're ready for the dialogue to go to this level and move beyond just the physical. And I wanted to uh, start with sharing with you a, a very disturbing video that was shared with me by a good friend and um, who also is uh, gluten intolerant and she shared it with me. Uh, but the saddest part is, is the, what it reflects about our societal attitudes and even the almost sanctioned bullying to some degree. I use that word a little loosely, but bullying of people who are different, in particular who have um, dietary challenges and how it's, it's, it's seen as okay and funny. So I'm going to run this video <coughs> and be patient with me on this logistical little shifteroo. And, I, and again, I want to apologize ahead of time if this is offensive, because it is offensive. And I want you to just notice what strikes you. And, and during the Q&A part at the end, I, I, you know, I really want to invite you to speak to this, because it, that what's going to be coming forward, many of the messages are things that we've all heard, if not even said ourselves. And so it's not about shaming ourselves for doing that if we have, because we, uh, and I'll get to that, but, uh, but for understanding that, that um, we really have a long way to go in terms of our, our societal thinking around food sensitivities. And let me know if the sound is okay, or if it's not okay. Can you hear it? How does the eating trend in the New Age community, since we found out you don't have to eat yeah. animals, gluten is the new animal you don't have to eat. Being gluten intolerant used to be limited only to those who are actually intolerant to gluten. But with the cutting edge information I'm sharing with you in this video, you too can be gluten intolerant regardless if you're truly intolerant to gluten. Being gluten intolerant is a fantastic opportunity for you to assert your dominance on the lives of everyone around you, which helps improve your life. So if you're ready to have a ravenous appetite for impossible standards and dogmatic feelings of victimization, then let's get started on what you need to do to become gluten intolerant. Be restaurant savvy. Go to regular restaurants and order. After they've brought you exactly what you've ordered, you discover there's gluten in it. This is the exact time you'll want to profess your gluten-free morals to the waiter. Is there gluten in that pizza? Yes. I didn't know that when I ordered it. I can't eat that. I'm gluten intolerant. It's a condition. You're going to have to take that back. Tell people about your most disgusting bodily functions. Being gluten intolerant means you're entitled to tell people about the offensive things that happen to you if you eat gluten. Because they're not gluten free. They're obligated by law to listen. I would get diarrhea on the spot. I mean, I would literally explode right now if I ate any gluten. Then I'd have bloody diarrhea every day. No, I said bloody diarrhea. What do you think I said? These don't have any gluten, do they? I'm starting to get a headache. I think those have gluten in them. Hmm. Give expert medical advice. Once you take your gluten-free vows, you'll need to have an automatic understanding that every <laughs> medical condition is caused by gluten. Depression, it's always caused by gluten. Obesity, that's 100% gluten. Every single case of cancer is caused by gluten. I swear, gluten is what killed Gandhi. 
never let anyone's efforts be good enough for me. If you're at a friend's house and they've gone out of their way and think they've met the Da Vinci Code of your gluten-free demands, they're not trying to be friendly. They're trying to overthrow your reign of control and dominance. You can't let this happen. You'll want to play the trump card of another food intolerance that you've never told them before. This puts you back in the driver's seat. This is all 100% gluten-free. That's so nice of you. Thank you. It isn't going to be there yet, does it? Because <laughs> I can't be there either. It's a little too familiar for many of us. Since being gluten-free is a nutritional philosophy based entirely on what not to eat, you don't know what you're actually supposed to eat. This means you have zero knowledge of what good nutrition actually is. But don't worry about that. To fill this small little loophole, you'll need to preach with conviction that anything that has no gluten in it is healthy for you. Awesome. You're gluten-free. You need to make the one so good for you. Do you want to have more vibrant for me? You know, like my bones are getting stronger. <laughs> Let's say you find a new gluten-free bread. How are you supposed to enjoy this coagulation of the serious flowers that form a grip with the density of a black hole? <laughs> Huge myth. Well, based on medical evidence that's yet to be discovered, there's a direct correlation between how many people are around and how gluten and power are. <laughs> that's baloney. Exactly. So many people believe this, though. Continuously read books that advocate a gluten free lifestyle. You do this even though you know the plot, moral of the story, and how the book ends before you even start it. You'll want to avidly stay abreast and how the latest author takes 300 pages to say, don't eat gluten. It's such a good book. I can't wait to get to all these. Great about your results. At this point, you're just mindlessly reciting the results you've had since you've been gluten-free so that you can justify your nutritional dogma. What if you haven't seen any improvements? No problem. Just make some up. Nobody will know the difference. Or care. My abs have gotten razor sharp since I've been gluten free. I mean, seriously. I don't know if this is from no gluten or if you Photoshop these things on me. At this point, you're armed to live a good life and bring your power. Enjoy. My head hurts so bad. I think I'm definitely going to Okay. <laughs> okay, it's not letting me stop this. Not being subscribed to my channel is a severe condition caused by gluten. Be sure to cure yourself by subscribing. <laughs> okay. Oh, here we go. I can just do this. You get the message. Okay. Did any of that sound familiar? Yeah. And anybody want to just chime in? Uh, anything that stood out for you that? Um, Food at friends' house when they go out of their way. You say you're gluten free, you know, and they say it's gluten free. But it's like I always feel like I'm stepping into a landmine. You just never know, do you? I just want to bring my own food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the exact same problem. I always feel like I want to say, I'll just bring my own. Don't worry about it. Don't mm -hmm. even think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you actually feel less anxious when you do. Yeah. 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 Um, it's really challenging going to restaurants 
And I was, I didn't want to have to identify what disease I had. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking you know, why do I have to identify if I have diabetes, or mm -hmm. I have epilepsy, or mm -hmm. I have celiac disease? Mm -hmm. Can't I just ask for a gluten-free meal? Mm -hmm. And when I would say, I would like a gluten-free meal, they go, well, do you have celiac disease? Exactly. And yeah. so I got to where I go, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But really, why does that make a difference? And what they've explained is that the gluten sensitivity folks and the non-celiac disease people have made it really difficult for the people with celiac disease that, that get really sick. Because a lot of people, I mean, my son was in high school, and he would say, oh, Mom, there's these girls at high school, and they go, oh, I'm gluten. I can't have gluten. I can't have gluten. They wouldn't have gluten. But then, if they felt like it, they'd be eating Oreo cookies. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of people that were kind of into the fad of being gluten intolerant that I think is really making it hard on people that really have the disease, and it really will damage them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a tough call because I, I agree. I think that it, who cares if someone chooses they don't want to have anchovies on whatever they eat. They don't eat seafood. Does anybody say, are you really allergic to anchovies? Do you, do you have an EpiPen? Uh, you know, does it, they just don't want to have anchovies. They may just not like them. Right? Uh, we've, we, there's a strange sort of, uh, I don't know how you describe it, but it, it's like everybody caring about what other people are eating and judging. And we're going to be talking a little <laughs> bit more about that because it's really big. And, and it's also created a very interesting dynamic in the gluten-free community because it's almost like it's a hierarchy. Um, have you had the biopsy? Have you had the blood work? You know, have you really classified as uh, celiac disease or not? And if you are, you know, then you're in that 1% of this special club, right? The in-group. And, and you know, I think we need to just get beyond that. Because the reality is, my prediction, I could be wrong, but I predict that in within the next 10 or 15 years, given where the research is, is going in learning about gluten, no one even knew gluten was an issue until super recently, really that what they're discovering, and as a psychologist, I see it with people around anxiety, depression, uh, between, you know, when, when people come in with anxiety and depression, I'm not a physician, I, I tell them to go to a nutritionist and dietitian, talk to their physician, go get, a, uh, go get tested for celiac disease and for allergies before they stop doing anything. And after they do that, just for fun, for one month, take out three foods that they can live without, gluten, sugar, and dairy. It may not make a difference, but I'm telling you, I have seen it happen so many times. People come back and they just want to hug me and kiss me. And they're just like crazy, uh, excited. They're like, oh my God, I have me back. After one month, the depression they've been struggling with for two years or however long, suddenly it's lifted. And we still can deal with emotional issues and talk <coughs> therapy, but I feel like I'm doing a disservice by not addressing that possibility. You know, when people have migraines, why not try that? I mean, I had migraines my whole life since childhood. I used to hit my head as a little person because my head would hurt so bad. My mom would say, stop doing that. I'd say, my head just hurts so bad. And, and since I've been off of gluten, which I didn't discover until I was 45, that I couldn't eat gluten, I have no more migraines except when I accidentally get uh, exposed to gluten. My whole world has changed. And they found, again, if you look at the medical research, that there is a higher proportion of people who have migraines, who have celiac disease, than those who don't. So you know, it's one of those no-brainers. No I think you know, as, as you know, in our healthcare professions, we need to you know, be thinking outside the box and, and really looking at the whole person. But I, I love what you said, and it's, it's, it's almost like you, you read my mind. Um, because one of the things, um, uh, oh, hold on a second, get to the next page. I wanted to mention is uh, about how there's, even within the gluten community, or the celiac, uh, or the gluten intolerance, or whatever we want to call it, or the people who just don't want to eat gluten for health reasons, or they think that their body feels better. They may not have celiac disease, but they, they feel bloated, they just don't feel so good. You know, who cares if they have celiac disease or not, and they don't want to have gluten? 
Just don't give them gluten. And let's ask for, uh, you know, the health, the people when they're preparing food to create environments where there can be safe breadboards and safe, you know, zones where, where there can be less risk of cross-contamination. Yeah. That's part of my dream. Again, this is where I'm, my, my lofty dreams. But I received this on the 20th of September. Today's the 27th, right? A week ago, mm -hmm. I received a, a Facebook message, which is pretty similar to what you just said. Um, th this person was clearly you know, dealing with a lot of personal issues, but, it, but what she said, because I'm, I'm speaking a lot about uh, empowering people around, they know I've written this book about uh, you know, yum, plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet, and, I, and I'm putting a lot of information out. Dr. Alessio Fazano is one of my endorsers. I put some of his material and other, other researchers' material on my Facebook. So this woman sent this message, and she, she wrote, do you actually have celiac disease, or are you a wannabe? This is, I, I literally cut, copied and pasted. Are you a wannabe? That was. She's writing to you. Yeah, she wrote to me. I don't know this person. Uh, in some, one, some of the face, some gluten-free celiac Facebook group, I'm not sure which. And then I replied that I have been clinically diagnosed. My, um, I, because I had been off of gluten for so long because, my, uh, because of the nature of my symptoms and how severe it was and how long I would be sick when I was exposed, the doctors said I could not, I could not be tested in the other ways and I'd already been off for you know, a long time before they were onto it. Um, so, but, but given my whole profile, they, I was diagnosed with celiac disease. Whether it's celiac disease or whether it's just severe gluten intolerance, I cannot, my body cannot tolerate gluten. That's all that matters to me. So whatever we want to call it. But anyway, so I, I basically alluded to that. Um, and then she wrote some other stuff, again, really angry. And then she said, so many who are going gluten-free are making things difficult for those of us that have celiacs as, as, so, as so many of the restaurants are not being as careful Beca this is an issue of the restaurants. This is not anyone else's issue. Uh, because of all the wannabe and those people order gluten-free, then eat the free bread or the cake as such, or such, just like when he was eating those cupcakes. So, the, uh, and you're talking about the, the kids at school who, you know, it might be that they're trying to avoid gluten for uh, weight management. I mean, we certainly have an obesity epidemic uh, so if, even if they are doing it for weight management, I don't care. That's that's a health issue too. This is this is a serious issue. So, um, so I understand what she's saying there because <laughs> um, we'll be with people, then they'll say they want gluten free, and then they'll say they want the bread. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that the servers are confused. Mm -hmm. They're, they're mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. they don't have a medical background. Mm -hmm. They haven't studied the implications of celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It, so it's just like any of us. So if someone doesn't seem to have the severe reactions, they may just choose to reduce. So a lot of people are reducing their gluten, um, and that's a personal choice. And and but uh, but I, I can understand how there's confusion. But but the the moving to a place of acceptance of letting every person choose what they put in their body, and what they don't put in their body. Th it, doesn't that seem like an easier solution? And you had a question or a comment? I just was going to piggyback on that. I mean, it's the same with disabilities, not. It's just Totally. It is so frustrating. And I feel like it's part of their duty, even if they don't fully understand it, in mm -hmm. their mind work, that they should know. Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. And we usually we don't have that healthcare background. We mm -hmm. usually tip them double. Mm -hmm. And we make sure that they know we're very appreciative. <coughs> and I think any time we eat in a restaurant, we should be tipping mm -hmm. as much as possible mm -hmm. so that they know that we're thankful. No way to communicate, absolutely. So, so these are exactly, this is exactly why we're having today's talk. So 
this idea of wanting to, when I was thinking about t today's um, conversation, is I, I love how um, mnemonics can come up. And what ended up coming up was uh, safe and not sad. I like to simplify things. And it also is relevant contentively because a lot of when we go to restaurants, and you were talking about how it's easier just to bring your own food, a couple of you are bring, you know, mentioning that, that you feel more safe because you don't wonder, you know, has that breadboard been tainted? Um, is that, you know, where that knife has been stored? What else has, has you know, flown in the air or what else, you know, you just it's don't. Or whatever else you may be allergic to. Yeah, I just had my book launch a week ago. I bought a whole, bu I hope, up entirely new blenders and breadboards and, and, and knives, equipment, because in my household and with my, my materials, I <coughs> use nuts and seeds. And I wanted this environment to be also safe for those, as safe as possible. The, the, uh, so, so, but, but it was a lot of work, but I really wanted it to be safe. You know, but, but it's only because we're in this, uh, that we're aware of those details. Other people would think, oh, I didn't use any gluten, but they're cutting on a breadboard or nuts. They're cutting on a breadboard that has, you know, you know, got who knows how many, uh, how much uh, quantity of it that's just in there. They don't know. And so it's, it's, it's that ignorance. And so for us to be patient, but also take care of ourselves is really important. So I'm just an you know, overview of this idea of being safe and not sad. And I, I'm a cat, cat freak. I'm part cat, uh, for those of you who don't know. And um, the idea that <coughs> when we live with allergies and other food sensitivities, it, you know, we need to find ways that we can feel safe still be connected in community like ourselves and feel happy. Uh, or, and so that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about. I yeah. want to say something yes. about restaurants. Mm -hmm. when, when I've developed the idea, I've been, I was diagnosed about 15 or 20 years ago mm -hmm. by a doctor who, who took me off of the stuff and I let me try it to see if it worked, if it was bad or not. Good for you. And uh, what I've the idea of doing, I don't like to involve all the people at the table mm -hmm. in this kind of talk. Mm -hmm. I go to find out who our waitress is going to be, and I go to her, and I say, I'm going to, I might need your help for this meal. Mm -hmm. I'm allergic to gluten and dairy, mm -hmm. and we go, and she, they usually know what it is now. Mm -hmm. And I say, so can you possibly help me not get anything that has those ingredients? Mm -hmm. And then generally, the, that doing that ahead of time, they'll mm -hmm. know when they come to the table which things I can have. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a gluten-free menu, mm -hmm. they'll have explored a little bit what I can have, and they'll say, the chef says, try that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's worked very well. Yeah, so that, and, and that can work. And it also, where we get in trouble sometimes, is, and I, most of us who are here, uh, we've all learned the hard way that sometimes things aren't called gluten or wheat, but they're called things like malt or, uh, you know, there's like these code things that, that even the kitchen staff may not know. Or the other place that we get in trouble is with condiments. That's, so I, I actually did a lot of condiments in my book because of that. I, I, uh, condiments oftentimes have little things of this and that and the other, and these mystery spices or natural flavorings, and you just go, ooh, I don't know what that is. So it, it but, but it's, it's wonderful when we do, and we, when we enlist them and say, can you help me? Uh, th very often people are, uh, almost always, they're, they're really helpful to the best that they're able to. And then do what she said, tip. Then tip them if they do a good job. Super tip. That's right. If, don't, if you're out of the restaurant in 20 minutes, don't mm -hmm. tip. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you run into a urology, mm -hmm. I know within 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you an hour. And you're out of there. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do the super tipper, then when you come back, then they're excited to see you too. So, so they treat you even extra special, which is nice. So, um, the other element that I'm going to talk about uh, during today's talk is uh, a mnemonic of seeing differently. Uh, I've been a huge fan of something called neuroplasticity, if you're familiar with a lot of the research now, that we can actually change our brain. And this is going to the place of how we view ourselves and how we view the world, that we can actually change from a victim kind of way of thinking to a gratitude and uh, what you're describing, very much a gratitude and positive perspective in our brain. So we actually feel happier, even though we live with food sensitivities or other health, you know, diabetes or whatever health challenge we are, we're dealing with. And um, so this idea of seeing and feeling differently, um, di regardless of our dietary limitations, is, is going to be one of our sources of power. Our brain is ours, yes. Ah. 
It's locked. Okay. I wish I had my scarves. I could loan my scarf to you. Either that or start going into perimenopause soon. <laughs> Join our ranks. <laughs> so. You know, I'm just cold because I'm allergic to blue, right? That, that, <laughs> it explains everything. That's right. <laughs> good to have something we can hang our hat on. Um, so, with this, so with this idea of things that make, uh, make it hard to feel safe in social situations, you know, you want to go out to dinner or you want to go out, go to a party, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that um, comes up around this is the sense of social isolation, and, and someone mentioned that, that, you know, you start to feel alone, like, you know, and you feel like you're kind of a freakazoid because you have to be treated differently and everybody has to, you know, you know, do like all kinds of hoop, jump through hoops and jump over things to, to please you. And, and it, it starts to feel pretty uncomfortable. A second thing was where we can find ourselves, and you may have already found yourself at times, avoiding certain social situations that involve food. You know, if it's just going out dancing, you're there. Right? You don't have to worry about the food. Yeah. But if it's a social situation, it's a dinner party, um, what happens is um, you can oftentimes feel like it's just easier, less exhausting, less complicated to just stay home. Because you know, you, you, either you can take your food with you, but then you don't want to be awkward about it, so you want to hide it. And, you know, it's like, you, like you're like, uh, you know, like some sort of a, uh, what, what would be like an undercover person with your, un your, your agent with your, you know, your hidden, your hidden stash. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, we've all done it, right? Um, and, or you can just sometimes, especially if after you've had you know, a really tired and exhausting week and, uh, or, you're, or you, you haven't been feeling so great and you know, maybe your symptoms haven't been so good, you don't even want to bother. Even if it just means going there for 20 or 30 minutes, you don't even want to bother. And you, you make up an excuse and you just don't go there. So, so you start to miss out on some of the um, social uh, opportunities, which is a loss. There's a loss around that. Fear of judgment. That video is a perfect example of how the judgment is infused in our culture right now. And, and even like that, you, you brought up the word fad, you know, this idea that it's a fad becomes a, uh, it's almost like it minimizes the choice to not I I eat gluten for whatever reason it might be, whether, you know, people don't have to know, maybe you have ADD or, or Asperger's or, or, you know, you may have other health issues that, that it just isn't very good for you. And you don't want to be telling the world, you know, you have depression, you have whatever. Uh, so it, it's very personal, but, the, but I, I've been very intrigued by how invested people seem to be in whether or not other people eat gluten. And the conversations that come up about it, it's, it's quite inter interesting. And then the last E in safe is the emotional challenges. And there's an, some overlap, but uh, I think you were alluding to the shame that, that you can feel, which I'm going to talk a little bit more 